text today is Matthew 13, uh, 5, 13 to 16. For you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of God. Amen. You may be seated. If you say you can sit down, it's just not the same. You have to say you may be seated, you see. So uh, today's message is salt and light. As you know, it's out of Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. And just to recap the last week, um, so I've been doing James, in case anyone's, why isn't he in James today? Well, because I wanted to take advantage of the moment that Paul was capturing last week in speaking and, and being in conversation with our neighbors and those in our culture about the gospel and about the good news that we have something worth sharing. And so last weekend I was at a conference and I taught for uh, me and a few other guys were conference speakers, whatever, uh, for three days and, and the conference was a missions conference. And the themes were Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the world. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so we took this conference in three phases, and the first session was Jerusalem. And so my first uh, lesson there was salt and light, and I had a subtitle said, Being is Doing. Because when we tend, you know, one of the difficult things about the Word of God is not what it says, but it's what we want it to say. And it's usually in here that the words get scrambled around and they lose their plain meaning. But if we just accept the text for what it says, it gets cleaner and easier. So there's really not a lot of need to do a whole lot of deep dive on some of this stuff if we just see it, read it for what it says, accept it, and move forward in that text. Matthew 28, 16 is about the Great Commission. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, to which Jesus had directed him. Now I'm missing that text. It's, it's not all there. So I will just quote it. It says, To go into all the world, making disciples, teaching everything that I have commanded him, for all authority has been given to me. And so what the scripture does not say is go into all the world and make converts. It says go and make disciples. Who makes converts? God. Now, did I do anything but just read the text for what it said? No no gymnastics, no having to go into the Greek, no participles there. Just real simple. Go and make disciples. Jesus says, because all authority has been given to me, go ye into all the world and make disciples. So uh, the interesting thing about that that we will learn is that when you go to make disciples, guess who's getting discipled at the same time? You. Amen? So the Great Commission is the conclusion. Uh, my, my, I just want to give my wife uh, credit. I had her type up this, uh, this sermon, and I told her, uh, Matthew twenty eight sixteen, and I forgot to add a few extra verses in there, and she just did what I told her. So, praise because she's looking at me going, "How did this happen? How did this happen?" So I'm just letting her off the hook and putting me on the hanger. So the Great Commission is the conclusion of five major teaching sessions in Matthew, and I'm just trying to give some context to the Great Commission because you you think I'm talking about salt and light, and indeed I am. But it's in a context. Nothing in the Bible is out of context. Something taken out of context is pretext. And we don't want that. So Matthew has five different sections, uh, considered major sections. Some commentators might expand those sections or shrink them according to how they divide some of the text. But it begins with the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through 7. 
And so it's an obvious imperative that flows out of Jesus' teaching that is his sheep, that we go and make disciples. And he starts all that right there in the Sermon on the Mount. R.C. Sproul says, Disciples are not just taught what to believe, but also how to obey. Jesus taught practical holiness, as Matthew showed us in the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus' instructions on relationships among believers and elsewhere. So my point there is I want to tie the fact that we start in, in uh, chapters 5 through 7 on the Sermon on the Mount. It, it, it finishes, it has a conclusion at the end of the book. It's almost like a therefore statement. And I said it's the obvious imperative because Christ here in the Sermon on the Mount is dealing with a lot of indicatives and what they mean. Because to be something implies it is a must be, it's an imperative that you do something. If you are an engine, it implies the imperative that you run. You see? And this is, where, this is why we use indicative. It points to, it indicates something. And so when the scripture says, you are salt and light, what do you think that sneaky little indicative is? That's right. It says, Matthew 5 and 13, you are salt. You are is you are, I'm sorry, is an indicative, okay? It's you are. It's not you will be. You have to strive to be. You have, you have to achieve something to be. No, Jesus makes a declarative sentence because he has called you into his fold. You are one of his sheep, and you are salt. You just got to understand what salt is so that you can... And so the discipleship process for you is understanding who you are and what that means. Now, I have to back it up just a second because, uh, like I said last week we were doing missions, I've, I've had this question given to me many times. You know, I just need some teaching on evangelism. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what that is. No, Kyle, you're real good at it, which I don't know that that's true. But... Uh, they, everyone wants to know what evangelism is and how to do it. The sneaky trick, the seven keys to the kingdom, the six, the six keys to evangelism. And it's really, in fact, I had that question uh, put to me last week by someone, and I said, actually, I think you know a lot more about evangelism than you know. And so as we dive into salt and light, I'm going to show you that you really know how to do evangelism. You really don't have to be taught it. It's a natural part of who and what you are. If I tell somebody, you know, you're an athlete, it's probably going to show because he's going to run and play and do all those things, or she. If I tell you you're a singer, I probably can't keep it shut up in a, in a box. You're probably going to sing in the shower. And so Jesus says you are salt and you are light. And, and this has to do also with the irresistible grace of God. I used, to, I used to exercise that in my own heart. Years ago when I first got, became a believer, I, I, I thought I could backslide and walk away from the Lord. And I would have these moments where my walk wasn't so good, and I found I couldn't walk away. You know why I couldn't walk away? Because I was salt. I was, I was a singer, and the band was right there, and I just couldn't resist jumping back in. Because that's who God made me to be. I, my nature was changed. I was a new creature in Christ. I can't run from it. You can run, but you can't hide. Because who you are is going to come to the surface. Salt is two things. It's seasoning and it's a preservative. And these are important little character traits. And I don't think um, Jesus was just shooting from the hip. I think he wants to understand salt. Salt is a seasoning. It enhances or transforms the flavor of food from bland to desirable. It makes one's food attractive and tasty. You ever had food that needs to be salted and you just, just not that great until you put salt on it? That's you. You are the flavor you are the seasoning in this world. This world is a bland, as it says in Ecclesiastes, under the sun, uh, hopeless condition. And it needs salt. And you are the salt. Now, I am not a chef, but I do make macaroni and cheese. In fact, and I'm not lying, my wife and my daughter think I make the best macaroni and cheese in the world. And it comes from a company called Kraft Macaroni and Cheese. And no, they do. When I tell them I'm going to make it, they're like, awesome. Your Kraft macaroni and cheese is great. 
So there's something that you do. You follow the label on the box. That's, that's really uh, my secret to my master chefiness. And in the box it says when you're boiling the macaroni, you put in a tablespoon or a teaspoon of salt because they want to boil that flavor into the macaroni. It's sublime. It's not sublime. It's, what's the word? It, it's discreet. It's a discreet way to flavor the macaroni so you get that delicious craft macaroni and cheese. But truthfully, that is the idea. One commentator says salt has little influence while sitting in a salt shaker. However, it is of great value once it is mixed in the right proportions in our food. Right proportions is very important. When it is sprinkled on food, or better yet, cooked into food, it transforms the food. So also Christians sitting alone in the comfort of their homes are unlikely to make much of a difference to the people outside their door. The people who need Christ, it is, a, it is as we rub elbows with others, both Christians and non-Christians, that we have the opportunity to bring a Christ-like flavor to their lives. Now that's not complicated. I don't need to know the Greek, and I don't have to go to a class for six weeks. That's real simple. You are the salt, and if you're just stuck in your little world and you're not interacting with human beings, whether it be your brothers in Christ or people in the world, how are they going to get any flavor? How are they going to get a sense of who Jesus Christ is? You know, it's like aroma in a room. Unless you're around to, like an incense, to fill the room, there's no flavor. And so the secret sauce is you being with other people. Now that's not complicated. But how do I do evangelism, God? Well, just be with other people. Now we're going to get to the, 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 the real uh, expose of this text in my mind uh, when we get to light. But the key here is, you know, how you, get, you know how you flavor this world? You know how you flavor people? You get involved in their lives. You spend time with them. You strike up a conversation. You be conversational. In fact, we have some people going to the mission field soon. And you know what their big mission plan is? It's really sophisticated. It takes loudspeakers and an amphitheater and an arena. Not really. Not really. You know what they probably learned going through training? They just want you to get to know people. Live your life around those people. Be Christ-like and make relationships. Now, is that beyond anybody in this room? Is that a real sophisticated system of evangelism? Or is that just what Jesus says, your salt? I want to I wanna take the mantle of evangelism and bring it right down to where we live because that's exactly... You know, you never see any in the New, in anything in the New Testament that says, this is how evangelism should look. We have one directive, Go. And, and how do they know? Because someone speaks and they hear and they listen. Someone is in conversation. Your life is a conversation. You're the entirety of who you are. And, you know, sometimes it takes years for people to see that. I was listening to uh, Paul's message last week and, and um, incorporating into that. It's true. When, the world say, when you say you have a message to the world, you have to have some substance that says it's real. Now, I'm not saying you create that. I'm saying you are that. And so when you tell people Jesus is the answer and he's the blessed hope, you know what the world who's full of skeptics and hardened lives and disappointments and sorrow, you know what they say? Prove it. Say, we don't believe you. You're just another con artist. That's a good, that's a good. I really like that, but. And so it's very, very important that as Saul that we live a Christian life in our communities, that we're something people can look to as a safe haven or as an opportunity to learn something that maybe they think they might need. And it might take a long time for people to see that. And it might take a long time for you to live a life that says, there's safety in my home. There's peace here in my home. Because there's a lot of... One thing I, uh, I've been learning lately, you'd think I wouldn't have to learn this, but I guess I've been seeing it more, is the young people in our culture have nothing. They have no moorings. All the foundations of our culture are being torn and ripped away. And family, the family is being destroyed. 
And so this world is losing hold of its moorings. We've lost hold of marriage. We've lost hold of the work ethic. We've lost hold of hierarchy, of our own sexuality. What do people and what do young people have to look forward to growing up in this world? Where is the stability in their world? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, it's you. And if it's not you, it's not there. Because Christ is the stability. Christ is the light. Christ is the salt. He is the flavor that makes life more than just cardboard. And so they go out and, do, and they sprinkle life with sin because they want to they want add flavor to the cardboard, and it doesn't work. It, it's like chewing cheap gum. It lasts for about a second, and then it's like, you know, when gum is not that great, and it's just like chewing cardboard. That's what this world has. And that's where we come in. We are the salt of the earth. Salt transforms the culture. Like salt transforms food. Rome was a culture. And you know the church was in persecution for 300 years. Christianity was not legal in the first 300 years that Rome was, was in control. And then, God gave a victory to the church, if you could call it that. However, God changed the scenario. And what happened in Roman culture is the way they viewed family, the way they viewed, especially the way they viewed sexuality changed. Because the church was declaring a different message. And they were living a different way. They changed their views on how they treated newborn babies when the church would come along and rescue babies that were being thrown away. Now, now that's not very um, pizzazzy. You're not filling stadiums and arenas doing that. But you know what you're doing? You're living a Christian life. You're throwing your life on the line and being Christ, being the hands and feet of Christ to a, a dying and lost world. And it may not stick at first. It may take a long time. But eventually, I, I, had a, I heard a testimony last week of a fella uh, his, his friend in high school hasn't seen him in 20 years. And then out of the blue, and he had, he had uh, his brother was in the hospital sick and dying, and out of the blue, 20 years later, after their relationship earlier, he calls back as he says, oh, Luke, yeah, he, he has something to do with Christ. And he calls him back, and he comes to the hospital. He was the only person to visit in the hospital. And the, and the young man's mother said, oh, and gave him a big hug and started crying. Now, my point here is that because this fellow was steady and stable and in Christ, he, there was an opportunity that, that opened up. And now they want him to do the eulogy at the funeral. See, you can be that person. You have that opportunity to be that lifestyle evangelist. Now, uh, when you're being lifestyle evangelist, lifestyle involves talking. Because you know what you do at home? You talk to people. You know what you do when you go get your tires fixed? You talk to people. You're not just magically emanating Christ. You're, you're adding flavor to every conversation. We are the agents of change. Galatians 4, 5, and 7. To redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. For you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir to God. Our conversations and interactions with others are like meals. Whether they are appetizers, entrees, desserts, or just samples for the tasting we need to season them with, salt, with the salt of the gospel. We must always keep Christ in focus. And so my orientation in life, by God's grace, is that every conversation is a Christ-centered conversation. Now that doesn't mean I'm going to mention the name Christ in every conversation. It means I'm at the ready. It means I'm at the ready to plant any seed. Like Paul said last week, one plants, the other waters, and another makes it grow. And so, how do, we, how do we face life? Do we say, oh, today's the game, today is baseball day, today is the game day, it's football day, today is whatever it is, I don't want to be bothered. Or is today, every day, a Christ opportunity day that Christ might be in the room? And once again, I am not saying that we even have to have a gospel conversation. We don't have to have a conversation that's pitching the gospel. 
But we do have to have conversations with people in life if that's ever going to occur. You see, there's, there, if there's no meal, if there's no opportunity, if there's no occasion, then you'll never be able to salt anything. And so my appeal here for us is to be evangelistically minded, if you would. To be salt minded. That's where evangelism comes from. It, there's no special secret to it. It's you being you. Matthew 5, 13b. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. The Greek word here for flavor is, and now this is our little Greek moment, but I thought it was important, is, is moranthe, M-O-R-A-N-T-H-E. Now that you know how it's spelled, you're all set. It comes from the root word moreno, which means become foolish. So salt has flavor, but when it's losing its flavor, it's becoming foolish. So to finish the quote from our previous commentator, he says, However, we must always stay alert that we impart a Christ-like flavor to them rather than allowing them to impart a secular flavor to our lives. So the idea is we are imparting flavor, not receiving it. And when we cease to do that, when we cease to maintain and preserve, then the world around us starts to de decay. Okay, when salt is a preservative, you put it into preserved food. But when the salt loses its saltiness, what happens to meats and such that they used to preserve with salt? They decay and they rot. And so then the salt is no good and has to be thrown out. Salt deposits along the Dead Sea contain salt and minerals. The salt can become useless when rain washes out its saltiness over the years. So what's the picture here? Your salt... This is, you're in for the long haul. This is the perseverance of the saints. This is you maintaining. And when we allow the world to erode who we are, this is why I'm kind of a stickler for doctrine. Because when we lose our spot, when we lose our spot, the whole ship is lost. Because we are the last hope. And so when we start adopting someone else's principles or start adopting, that's like having rain wash out all the salt and all that's left is useless minerals. When we deliver the gospel and we tell them to trust, they do say, prove it. If we are not the preserving church that preserves truth and wisdom, then we have lost our saltiness. Then we're only good to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You know, uh, the Amplified I like it. It says, it is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and walked on by people. And then in, in, in brackets it says, when the walkways are wet and slippery. Now anybody who's lived up north knows what salt is for. You put it on the road so that it, you don't slip and slide in the ice and slippery surfaces. And so basically all they're saying, uh, this text is saying is, you know, when, when you're not preserving anything, all you're good for is to be stepped on so people don't skid and slide. You've lost your ability to preserve. You've lost your ability to flavor the room. In uh, World War II, they called that the greatest generation. Now, my dad was a World War II vet. I have utmost respect for World War II warriors and the World War II generation for, for the sacrifices they made. But I think in our culture, we've overinflated the value of, of, of that generation by calling it the greatest generation ever. And here's why. Because from the, and, and, and the idea here is when salt doesn't retain its saltiness, it has an effect on our culture. And, 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 and for all that that culture did and for that generation, for what they did and achieved, I think it's because they were living on the capital of previous cultures. And each culture, each generation is losing its saltiness. And so the 40s produced the 50s. And the 50s was basically characterized by a lot of materialism. Everybody had a new home. Everybody was buying cars. Life was great again. And I get it. If I had just been to war, I'd be doing that too. But in somewhere in the mix there, we lost as a culture our saltiness, our Christian saltiness. 
And you know what the 50s produced? The 60s. Yep, exactly. And you know what the 60s produced? That would be me, the 70s. My older brothers and sisters were 60s teenagers. I was a 70s teenager. But the slide, the culture lost its salt because the 40s generation, all they had was a hollow shell of authority, do this, don't do that. And you know what the kids in the 60s says? Prove it. Show me. Don't just tell me. Don't just give me commands. Tell me why, what. Where's the substance of what you say? By the 70s, we just said, ah. and we just moved on and did our thing. And now look at us. Our culture is depleted of its moorings and its foundations because the church has not been salt. We're losing our saltiness. And, and so we think evangelism occurs on a TV show or at 7 on Wednesday night. But actually evangelism and saltiness occurs in your living room. It occurs when you're getting your tire changed. It occurs at the restaurant when you're seasoning your conversation with grace. And we'll get to that in a second. So it says, you are light. Now this, is the, this text has always brought me to this section of scripture. It says, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill... And cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Now it says, like salt, you are light. It doesn't say put a 60-watt bulb in and make yourself brighter. It doesn't say go and generate power from the power company and be light. It says you are light. In fact, what is the problem in this scripture? What, what do, what's the roadblock that Jesus is removing in this text it says, in the same way, let, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. If we would just get out of the way and let the light shine, that's all we need to do. Now, that's not complicated either. See, if, going back to my earlier point, if we just read this for what it says and don't read into it, what does it mean by, so what would that look like in your life if you let the light shine? Well, what it means is when you're talking to the guy at the tire shop and a Christian thought comes in your head or a Christ-centered thought comes in your head that you would normally share with people, do you hold it back? Because, now, there's a time to hold that back, but do you hold it back because you're embarrassed? Do you hold it back because you're like, oh, that would, uh, he would think that's, uh. or do you share your life? See, the light of Christ is in you. If you just let it shine, how are they even going to know you're a Christian if you're just constantly putting Christ under a bushel? If you're taking Christ off the hill and putting him down in the valley, how do they know anything about you or anything about Christ? Because you're not the point. How do they know about you? Because you're not the point. The point is Christ is living and shining through you. And so we have to be about Christ-centered conversations. And like I said, it, it has nothing to do with whether we share a gospel message or a scripture. But like, sometimes when I'm, when I'm talking to people about my daily life and they're talking to me about this, and, and something happened, and, I, and in my mind the thought is, wow, the Lord delivered me from that. Why wouldn't you share that with the world? Why would you hold that nugget of truth back when that's the, the very foundation of your whole life? Why don't we say to the mechanic or to the, the grocery store person as we're sharing a conversation, not as we're intentionally just, just, you know, but as we're sharing a conversation or your coworker, why do we hold back on statements like, man, the Lord delivered me from that. That was a close call. I was really convicted about that sin. Now, some people are worried that we have too much Christian talk going on there. But at the same time, how are they going to know what Christian talk is if they never hear it? How are you going to drive their curiosity if you're hiding your light? If you're shoving it under a bushel and they never even know how you think and believe? And what I mean is this is a winsome and casual event. This is not some intentional uh, evangelistic moment where you're trying to you know, give them the four spiritual... This is just you being you. This is how you love your neighbor. This is how we love one another. Just be yourself. Don't hold back. 
And you know, you know, wisdom is, is really necessary in this arena, and it's not my point to tell you how to say it, what to say. See, that's what evangelism um, seminars are about. The, um, the tricky way to say something or the right apologetic to use at any given moment. I'm not trying to do that today. Uh, what I'm trying to do is say, get out of the way. I don't know what you... See, only you can share who you are. I can't share who you are. You're a special person in a special circumstance at any given moment. And God has placed you there providentially. And I can't say what only you can say. I don't have your testimony. I don't have the things in my heart that you have in yours. Do you think that they're unique and God wants to use them? So that whatever you wish that... In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So what are these good works that God wants to let shine? Well, the rest of the next two chapters in the Sermon on the Mount is how you love people and how you love God. You live in such a way that, that is salty and preservative, has flavor, has an aroma. You know, I've had a circumstance in my life where um, someone has been exposed to my home who hasn't had that same opportunity or experience, and they really like what they're seeing. They're going, wow. When you, when, is your home a place of peace so that when you bring strangers and people who don't know the gospel, do they come to your home and say, oh, it, it's, it's a little different than it is out there in the world? Wow. Like, dad loves his family, and mom loves dad, and the children, they all get along. You know, We don't live in a world like that. We live in a world of broken homes and broken families. Is that flavor there? And so we love God, we love our neighbor, and this is how we let our light shine. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. That's Matthew 7, 12. That's the end of the Sermon on the Mount. That's not by happenstance. Jesus is summing up the whole sermon. You are salt, you are light. Love your brother as yourself. Love your God. This is how the message is transferred. If love is not driving the train, if you're just convicted that you need to be an evangelist or that you need to notch up some numbers on a belt, they'll know it. Because it's not you. Just be yourself, you see? That's how complicated evangelism is. I think people know more about evangelism than they know. But I think people are afraid to do that. And you know why they're afraid? Because they're thinking about themselves. I heard Paul mention that last week. Self-consciousness is probably your biggest enemy. You know, Adam and Eve sinned, and what was the first thing that happened? They found out they were naked and covered themselves up. You know, they became self-conscious. You know, uh, my dog is not self-conscious. My dog has no concern in the world except food. It wants food for me, and I can do all kinds of things, and I can say all kinds of things to that dog, and it, it just goes past him like the wind. He just wants that piece of food. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. It's the food I'm looking for. And you know, that's, that's if, if we can just divide, you know, love is selfless. If we can get rid of self, consciousness, it's about me. And we can feel it and love one another and think, I'm salt and light for this. I may be the only contact point for anybody in this room if you're in a room. Or outside. And so what am, where is my awareness level? What is my point? Why am I in this room? Why am I in this store? Why am I anywhere? Is it, is it all about me? Or is it because this is opportunity time for Christ? Because I love these people. Now, if you have an issue with loving people, that's okay. That's how you become a disciple. You make disciples, you become a disciple. You become a more mature disciple. So what does evangelism look like? Well, it's about being intentional about life and conversation. Sometimes it's being uncomfortable. Sometimes I'm, you know, when I, when I had a newborn baby, I, I, my little girls, we weren't sure how to change her and feed her just yet. I was a little uncomfortable, you know. That's okay. But I loved my daughter enough to say, who cares? I'm going to learn. I'm going to find out. It means being eager. It means being Joshua and Caleb. It means having a, a positive attitude that God is in control because God says, I have all authority, so you go out and be, and then I'll take care of this. I'll make the converts. You just worry about the discipling. That's, that's, that's my charge to you. 
Sometimes it means just being there. Sometimes it just means being a good neighbor. It means being a soft voice that turns away wrath. Sometimes it means just sitting and being a friend. You know, that is, that's evangelism too. Because, you know, in any conversation, a lot of times what you don't say is a lot more powerful than what you say. Less is more. It means cultivating relationships for Christ. And uh, something that I find, now I'm going to give you an evangelism tool. Okay, this is going to be the tool that I give you. Offer to pray for someone. Most people who have a need, they don't mind letting you pray for them. I'm not even saying you have to pray for them on the spot. But what more Christ-like thing can you do when you're in a conversation and someone says, yeah, my son got in a bad accident. Or such and such happened. You say, oh, really? This is what I tell my, my, my uh, when I see, I say, you know, me and my wife, we pray together a lot. We're going to pray for you about that. Would you mind that? Oh, no, that would be great. That would be fantastic. Because we are the hands and the feet. We are the means of grace. 2 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3, we, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? Key verse, you yourselves, you yourselves are our letter of recommendation. Written on our hearts to be known and read by all. You are the gospel message. You are the book. Until you can give them a Bible and get them to read it, you're that book. So be ready. Eagerness. Ephesians 6.15 And as shoes are your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So I'm going to give you guys a little thing that I did last week. I don't expect anybody to do this. This was simply an exercise we did with the youth at this conference. This is not typical to our culture, and I don't expect anybody to do this. But the point of this exercise was to teach these kids to, hey, you know, you can strike up a conversation with anybody if you just ask that you just want to pray for them. So we went out into a little town where this conference was being held, and we would just approach people and ask them. We said, well, this is what I did. I said, listen, I'm not a Mormon, and I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I'm not here to get something out of you. I'm not asking you to go to church. We're just trying to be good neighbors, and we just wanted to know if there's anything we could pray for you about. Now, I had some people who are believers and said, no, we're good, but we love what you're doing. Keep it up. I had another lady say, oh, yeah, that was, that's really neat. And as we started talking to her, she started crying and telling us she needed prayer because her son had just been put in prison and she was a believer and she thanked us for what we're doing and then I pardoned myself and a couple of the girls that were there one of the older ladies went and comforted her and prayed with her some more now she was already a believer and you say well that's is that evangelism Kyle no but it, you know what it is it's loving one another you know what it is it's exercising you and it's exercising them and you don't know their condition by the way they may say they're a christian or they may go to church a little but maybe they need a disciple to come along and help them to be better you know it's not just it's not actually it's not about winning souls what did the great commission say it's about making disciples what if some com- someone says yes to you or they're open to something you know what i'm going to do i'm going to go great little at a time, we're just going to bring into discipleship this individual that's in front of us. Because at the end of the day, you, you, you don't always know where someone's heart is at. You don't, excuse me, you don't always know if they're a believer or not. But what you can always know is you can share Christ, you can love them, and you can walk beside them and with them into maturity, into Christ. If you're sitting next to somebody for 30 minutes in this church and you haven't said anything to them, well, you're missing some opportunity. And I don't mean just this church. I mean in any, any situation where you find yourself sitting to someone, hey, look, there's days where I don't say anything to anybody. All right? There's, there's, there's no rules here. I'm not trying to make rules. I'm just trying to say be you. So as we go out into this world, let's be aware. Let's be loving and kind to people in their circumstances that we, and hey, look, I have my bad days. I have my days where I don't want to talk to anybody. I have my days where I'm driving around the car and I'm kind of upset at how bad everybody is out on the road, except me, of course. And so I'm simply saying, let's live a lifestyle. Let's be conversational. 
in such a way that puts Christ at the center, that is loving and looking for people's needs, that says, can I pray for you? I'll tell you, if you want to in into anybody's life, just offer to pray for them. There are people actually that are hungry and that have real bad circumstances. And you're like a, you're like a drop of water. You're like an oasis. And, and I'll be honest with you, that's how things grow. That's how the church grows. Apart from having little children. That's another church growth methodology. So, amen today. Uh, as we go out, just remember your salt and your light. And this, because this is your mission field. We have a couple, like I said, who's going to go to the other side of the world and plant themselves in a different mission field. And that's their whole program. Just live with the people. Love them. Invite them to church. Uh, be there for them. Pray with them. Share a meal. A meal. That, it's, it's just that simple. So let's go and be salt and light today. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your word that you are planting in our heart. Uh, I thank you that you've made us salt and light, Lord, that your word emanates from our saltiness and from the light that you put in us. Let us be loving and kind to one another. Let us have people, let us not be self-conscious, but be conscious of you and those people that you want to bring into your fold as we go out. In Jesus' name, amen.